Welcome to How to Make Your Campaigns More Viral. My name is Becky Wiegand with TechSoup, and today we are joined with Jim Pugh from Share Progress. To give a quick introduction, again my name is Becky, and I am the Interactive Events Producer here at TechSoup. And I have been here for about 5 years coming from a background of working for a series of small nonprofits in Washington, D.C. and Oakland, California, and now San Francisco, where I had to solve a lot of problems without technical expertise and run campaigns and, and just try and make things work while wearing many hats. So I know many of you may be in a similar position, and so we are really thankful to have access to experts like our presenter today, Jim Pugh, who is a CEO of Share Progress and came to, to share progress from having worked for the 2008 Presidential Campaign and Organizing for America as one of the data gurus that helped successfully win the Obama election, and is still working on many campaigns for different public policy and politi political causes across the country. You will also see in the back end, Ali Bazdikian from TechSoup who will be there to grab any of your questions and help you with any technical issues throughout the webinar. Just to quickly go over today's agenda, we will spend just a couple of minutes introducing TechSoup since we are your host today. And we will take a couple of minutes to have you tell us a little bit about you. That will help inform our presenter on who is joining us live on the phone today so we can better speak to your needs. and then. I'll hand over to Jim to talk about pressing the viral button and that what that means. And is that a real thing that you can just do, or is it a little bit of a misnomer? And also, what is virality? And then he's going to give us some examples of campaigns that have been optimized and what the differences are between one that's been optimized and one that's not, and what the impact is on their numbers when they're able to optimize. And then we'll have time for Q&A. So quickly launching into who is TechSoup or what we do, what we are. We are part of TechSoup Global, and this is our mission statement. We are working toward the day when every nonprofit social benefit organization has the tech, knowledge, and resources to operate their, at their full potential. And part of that is hosting webinars like this where we hope that you will come away with some expertise that you garner from our experts here, and can use that to better meet your organization's mission. And we are a 501 nonprofit. You can see a little bit about our impact across the global sector of nonprofits and libraries um, with more than $3.6 billion in IT expenses saved in 56 countries across the world. Most of those are donated from 63 different donor partners in the U.S., um, including companies like Adobe, Cisco, Microsoft, and Symantec. So if you're not familiar with our donation program, and you come from a nonprofit or library background, definitely check us out at TechSoup.org to see what kind of donated software, hardware, and services that you can access through our programs. Now on to the topic of the day quick poll of our participants. Can you let us know, have you run an online campaign before? This will help us understand sort of what your background is um, individually. So have you, you Cynthia, you Daniel, you Christian, individually have you run online campaigns before for your organization or your cause or your library? This will help inform kind of what your level of experience is are you the expert that should be a presenter on this webinar today? I'll just give a couple more seconds for you to respond to that by clicking on one of those radio buttons on the screen. We have some folks chiming in in the chat saying, yup, or no, I have not. No previous online campaigns. So we can see that about 52% have not but would like to start. A few people saying that they are not sure, so maybe a quick definition of online campaigns, what that is, what that means, might be helpful when we get started to make sure we are all on the same page. And so I'd say the majority of our users have either not or have only done it a couple of times. So that helps a lot in informing you know, some of the direction that we will take with the content. And then one other quick question, what size is your organization's email list? Go ahead and 
select one of these. If you're not sure that's okay as well, and this isn't used for anything but the purposes of this webinar. We're not linking this to your name or your organization or anything like that. It's just to give us an idea of how many people are currently on your list that you are reaching through email so that we can get an idea of what sort of audience you are working with currently. So just a few more seconds to let people participate, and then we'll move along. It looks like about half of our group almost is less than 1,000, and almost the other half is 1,000 to 10,000. So that's helpful I think in informing where most of our organizations on the phone are coming from, most of our participant organizations. So with that, I'd like to go ahead and introduce our presenter today. So we're really fortunate to be joined by Jim Pugh from Share Progress, who is truly a, an expert leader in this field. Um, no matter what your pol political stripes, there's a lot of competition in getting people like Jim to share some of their wisdom on how they've been so successful in creating viral campaigns. So welcome to the program, Jim. We're so glad to have you. Thanks for inviting me, Becky. Look forward to this. Um, so as you may have gleaned from the poll questions, we're really going to be focused today on online campaigns and looking at virality there. Um, and for those of you who have run a campaign before, if, if when you have been creating and setting up that campaign, if, if you did look um, in whatever system you're using and try to find that viral button, you probably saw it wasn't there. Um, unfortunately, it's a bit harder than just clicking a button to make a campaign go viral. Um, but there are some key things that can be useful to, to know about that, and some key uh, approaches that you can use to actually make your campaigns be at least more viral, if not actually go viral. Um, so uh, as was mentioned, I'm Jim Pugh from Share Progress. Uh, the startup that uh, I've run for about the last year, and we work primarily with nonprofits um, to help them get more of their online supporter base to to effectively act as social ambassadors and to share the campaigns they're running and the content they're producing, and get more of their friends to see it and engage. So let's get started. So to begin with, let's just begin with start with the definition. What is virality? Viral is a word that gets thrown around all the time. Um, but not, it's often something that people don't have really a firm grasp as to what exactly it means. Um, some uh, recent usages that I'd heard when I was drafting this presentation, people asking, oh, go make me a viral video. Or there's a viral campaign happening right now on Twitter. And at, literally as I was creating this slide for presentation, I received an email that said, social media goes viral on Capitol Hill. So people use it all the time. They know it means something is going big. But what's a key thing to note about virality? It's not just how many people are seeing something or doing something. It's actually a measure of growth. It's how many people are actually sharing this with their friends, and how is that causing the number of people either seeing the, the video or taking part in the campaign to grow um, beyond that initial, um, that initial launch and that initial push. So, there's not going to be, for those of you who are concerned about it, there's not going to be much math in this um, presentation. I do want to go into some, some very um, top level definitions though, um, so you have a sense of, of what virality literally means. Um, so a key concept to be thinking about for virality is what's called the virality ratio. And what that is, it's a measure, it is a measure of growth when you have a, a video or a campaign you push out there, how much it's spreading. Um, and what it actually tells you is that for every new person that comes in, for every person who sees that video, for every person who signs that petition, on average, how many people are they recruiting them to come back in and also see the video or also sign the petition? Because what that will tell you is what it looks like over time as, as people engage with, with your content um, and, and tell their friends about it. So something that actually goes viral is something where that virality ratio, where that amount of spread is actually greater than one. So for every person that comes in, they're actually getting more than one of their friends to come back and check it out as well. And so what happens then is you get this explosion that even if you start with only a handful of people, um, you can end up with thousands or even tens or hundreds of thousands of people coming in and engaging. 
because those people are, are telling their friends, and friends are telling their friends, and it just gets bigger and bigger. Now, what happens in almost every case is that you actually have something which is sub-viral, which means that ratio is less than one. So you could have something that people tell friends about, oh, this is kind of a cool video. Let me, let me send this to, to one or two people I know. And then, um, but maybe those people aren't so interested or busy with work, and so most of them don't actually check it out. Um, what happens then is that you can still get your content spreading. People can still pass it along, but it will kind of the spreading rate will slow down, and you'll you'll get this kind of plateauing effect um, beyond that, that initial initial group of people that you launch to. So just to give you some examples, you can see what this really means. Um, we can look at a couple different virality ratios for, for hypothetical campaigns here, uh, and look at how that affects the, how much they spread. So let's say that we're talking about um, some, some petition that's being launched, and you're sending it out, and you're going to get 5,000 people to sign it. Um, now, if you have a virality ratio of 0 0.01, that means that only one out of every 100 people who signs is going to get someone else to come in. So you send it out to those 5,000 people, and they sign up. Those 5,000 people then tell a couple friends about it, and they get 50 more people to sign up. And then those 50 people tell some folks, but they only convince another one person. So really you haven't gotten that many more people than just your initial launch. Now a second case, we can look at what happens if we have a virality ratio of 0.1 or 10%. Um, in that case, your initial 5,000 people actually recruits another 500 people to come and sign. Those 500 people recruit another 50. And in the end, uh, you end up with um, an extra 550 some odd um, who have come in and signed beyond that initial group that you launched with. Now, if you start getting virality ratios that get closer to one, you see you start to see the power of, of how this plays out over time. Um, if you have 0.5, you already if just through that spreading across people passing along to a friend, and then those friends passing along, you can end up with almost double how many people you started with. And if you get something that's either almost viral, 0.9%, or actually is viral, 1.1%, you can turn those initial 5,000 people into either 32,000 if it's almost viral, um, or if you actually cross that threshold and get something that goes viral where people are recruiting more people and more people coming in, you can really get an explosive growth and, and turn that initial 5,000 to 80,000 and later. Um, so just to dig in a little bit more and try to understand what's going on here, we can actually uh, look at something that's called the viral loop. And this describes how, how growth actually um, works in, in, the, in the context of the campaign here. So there's really three steps to the process. The first one is the action step. And that's actually having someone who's coming to your site take the action that you want. So if it's a video, it's actually someone watching a video. If it's a petition, it's actually them adding their name and submitting the, the form on the website to, to sign that petition. Once they've taken the action, the next step is for them to invite their friends. Um, they, it's someone who says, oh, that was either a really cool video or this petition is something that really matters to me. I should be telling people about it. So maybe they post it on Facebook. Maybe they post it on Twitter. Maybe they email their friends. Um, maybe there's someone down the hall from them and say, hey, check this out. I'm going to send you a link right now. Um, but however they do it, they end up inviting people to come in uh, and, to take the, and to engage as well. And so the next step is to respond to them. And that's seeing how many of their friends that they ask are actually responding. If they post on Facebook, people may look at it and say, whoa, that's really cool. I want to check this out. Or they may say, eh, I'm busy with other stuff and ignore it. So, but the number of people who respond there, that uh, determines how many people are coming back to your website uh, or to your video page and then have the potential to take action as well. And that's where the loop repeats. Um, and so if we want to figure out what our virality ratio is here, all we have to do is you have to go through these steps one by one and look at, and, and we're really just multiplying uh, what's happening at each step. How many people are taking action? How many people they're inviting? How many of those people they're responding? And that will tell us what that ratio is and how many, what our growth is on, on the campaign. Um, okay, so that is really how virality works. 
Um, so hopefully that gives you a better sense of what's going on. But really the next question is, okay, I see that, but how can I increase it? Because you really want to know how when you are um, pushing out a, a video or running a campaign that you can get more people through, through Lava Growth. So the key thing to remember is, is what we just talked about, which is that your virality ratio is the action rate multiplied by the invite rate multiplied by the response rate. What that means, if you can improve any one of those steps, if you can either get a higher action rate, a higher invite rate, or a higher response rate, that means your virality ratio is going to go up. So the trick is, how do we improve those rates? So let's take a look at a simple example campaign here. Let's say that um, your organization is launching a petition. Um, and it's a petition that people are somewhat interested in. Um, they they want to sign it and tell their friends about it. And so you start with a virality ratio of 0.1. So on average, for every person who signs, they are going to recruit 0.1 person, which I mean, that means for every 10 people who sign, they are going to recruit one person. Um, what happens at the end is that this will uh, increase the total number of actions you get beyond your initial launch by 11%. So it's not a ton, but I mean you're, you're getting a boost there. But now let's think through what happens if we can actually do optimizations and improve those different steps that we just talked about. So you have your, uh, your action page, your petition page where you're asking people to sign. Now if you make smart choices about how that page is designed, and if you do um, web page optimization, you can actually get it so more people who are coming to that page are actually signing the petition. So let's say uh, we make some smart choices, so we make some adjustments to the page, and we increase the number of people who are taking action and signing that petition by 20%. So next we look at that invite step where we're asking people or getting people to tell their friends about it. Um, if you are, if, if you're uh, again uh, use good practices about how you um, how you set up. A, a follow up share page for that petition where you're actually asking people to post on Facebook and post on Twitter and to email their friends, you can actually get a lot more people to share than if you, um, than if you don't have that. If, if you're using either um, some, some very basic straightforward bu um, share button, uh, a Facebook Live button, or not having anything at all. So by using effective sharing, you can actually get uh, as much as 60% or more people to be telling their friends and saying, hey, I just signed this petition, you should too. And then finally the last step is how do you get those friends um, that people have reached out to to then come back um, and engage and, and sign up and uh, check out that petition as well. Um, to do that, really what's going to make a difference is what language people are using. When they email their friends or when they post on Facebook, what are they saying? What are, um, how are they encouraging their friends to get involved? Um, and if you can make smart choices about that, you can actually get a lot more people who are, who are clicking through and coming to check out your site. Um, so now if we take the, the equation we had before looking at how we calculate our virality ratio, um, we started this virality ratio of 0.1. 20% higher action rate means that we are increasing it by 20%. 60% higher sharing rate means that we are increasing it by an additional 60%. And a 30% higher rate means that we're increasing by an additional 35%. What that works out to is you went from a virality ratio of 0.1 to 0.26. So we more than doubled it by making these optimizations. And what that translates to is that instead of just getting an extra 11% of people coming in and signing petition, you're getting an extra 35% now. So if you started with 1,000 people, instead of getting an extra 100, you're getting an extra a few hundred uh, by making those changes. Hey so Jim, just to interrupt you really quickly, sorry yeah. to jump in here. We had a couple of questions just where people were asking for clarification around what's an action page and a share page. Um, can you just define what those would look like? And I have to say you must be really good at math because percentages, not my forte. <laughs> but, but I can understand you know, the, the point of getting better impact off of these individual pages and if you increase those rates, which in just a few minutes he's going to show us some examples of what an optimized page looks like and what an optimized share page looks like um, to give us ideas of how we can actually tweak those things in real, real world. But if you could quickly just answer what's an action page and a share page, what do those mean? Yeah, absolutely. 
So an action page is when, when you have, uh, a, say, a petition you're running online, um, you want people to put in their information, put in their name, put in their email address, maybe where they live, um, in order to sign that petition. So the page where they do that, that's where they're, they're taking that action. That's where they're, they're signing. Um, so that's what we call the action page. So ideally, when you want the people who are, who are coming to that page who are interested in your petition, you want more of them to be, to be adding their name there and then putting in their information and then click, clicking Submit on that form. Um, the Share page is after they click Submit, uh, generally what will happen is that you'll get a page that says, Thank you for signing. And on that page you can say, Now will you tell your friends? Um, and then you can encourage them to, you can give them this button that says Post on Facebook. So if they have a Facebook account, they say, oh, okay. And they can click that and say, I just signed a petition. You should too. And maybe you have Great. a button to Great. share on Twitter and, and so on. That's really helpful. Uh -huh. And I think you know, that could be for a petition like you mentioned, or it could be for some other kind of action too. Like is it, could it be you know, if somebody is um, signing on to your campaign or saying that they want to be a supporter of your cause or whatever it might be that that page that they are signing themselves on to is the action page. And then there is an invitation for them to share it with friends or family or colleagues as the landing page after they get to that. Absolutely. This could be when, when people come to a website, if you have a page where they can join your organization and sign up for your list, that could be this as well. That action page could be that form where they sign up for your list. And then you can follow Great. that also with the share page. Okay. Well, and the person who asked one of those questions is asking specifically what it means to be optimized, and that's what's coming up in these case studies. So he'll go over some specific examples of what it means to optimize those pages in just a couple of minutes. Mm -hmm. So stay tuned. Um, yeah. <laughs> Jim, back to you. Thank you. We are, we are definitely going to, to give you some more concrete examples. Um, and I'm not going to go, uh, go in depth through to this second example campaign. But what you can see here is that if you start with a campaign that are from the start is more viral, that instead of having a viral ratio of 0.4, you have uh, 0.1, you have 0.4. Um, by doing those optimizations, you can actually turn something that's sub-viral into a viral campaign by increasing that virality ratio above 1. And then you get that explosive growth. So with that said, let's move on to some concrete examples. Um, so we're going to look at two different case studies now. Um, the first one comes from Credo Action, uh, which for those of you who aren't familiar, they're uh, uh, an organization that does a lot of petition campaigns around politically progressive causes. Um, and the, the example we're going to look at from them is actually a petition they ran um, against Monsanto. Um, this was a petition they launched back in May of this year. Um, the U.S. Congress had passed a law which gave extra special protections to Monsanto um, that prevented, uh, protected them from, from lawsuits. Um, and so they ran a big campaign to say this is not a fair law. We need to stand up and tell, um, tell Congress to, to repeal this. Um, so Credo does a lot of online campaigning. They actually have a very big um, list of online supporters of more than 3 million people they can contact. So often their petitions um, get tens or even hundreds of thousands of people to sign on. Um, so what, uh, in this particular case, so generally for those of you who haven't run uh, online petition campaigns or some of the ones before, um, most, of the, most of the signatures you get on those campaigns are from the outreach that you as an organization do directly. So when you send an email to people who are subscribed to your email list saying, hey, this is important, please sign this, they'll sign it, and then you'll get a little bit more sometimes from people who are passing on to their friends. But it's usually not very much. Usually less than 2% of, of those signatures you get are from people who are passing along. In this particular campaign, Credo actually got 13% of their signatures from social sharing. Um, and this was a big campaign. They had over a quarter million people who signed it. And so what that meant is that they actually got, uh, got 25,000 new people who had never been involved with Credo before um, to sign on and, and then get involved with Credo through that campaign. So this was a, a, big, um, 
a big growth moment for them. Not only did they get a lot more support on this particular petition, but they got a lot more supporters out of it as well. So how did they do this? And the answer is that they used the process I was just describing. They optimized participation. And just a minute I'll explain more what that means. Um, they used the Share Progress Share page in order to get a lot more people to tell their friends about it. And then they optimized their share language. Again, I'll, I'll define what this actually means in a second. But in order to improve every one of the steps of the process to make their campaign more viral. So first thing, optimize petition page. Um, when this is an example of an action page as I mentioned earlier. This is the, uh, the web page that people will come to when they are um, considering signing the petition. So they are able to put in their name, their email address, and their location here, uh, and then click Sign the Petition button in order to add their name there. Um, what Credo did was to actually do, um, do testing on this page um, where they would try out different versions of the page. They would try out um, using different titles or um, you see in the top right corner they have a thermometer there to track the progress. They would they actually tried um, saw what happened when they had that and when they didn't, and they did comparisons to see, okay, what actually motivates people the most to want to sign this petition? Um, and it turns out by making sometimes by making very small adjustments to the page, you can actually convince a lot more people to sign who are who are coming here. And so through those uh, that testing and those adjustments they made, they were able to uh, increase the number or the number of people who were signing their petition by around 20%. Um, so those, as I said, those, those sometimes very small changes uh, can make a big difference. Um, the second step was that they used a share progress optimized share page, um, which, and when I say optimized here, it, I actually mean a very similar thing. Um, we at Share Progress have spent a lot of time um, designing and trying out different uh, pages um, or different designs and different language that can be shown to people after they sign a petition or after they sign up for an email list or, or after they make a, an online donation in order to encourage them to tell their friends. Um, using a lot of inspiration from social psychology to figure out what actually makes people more motivated. To, to reach out, but also looking at uh, when we when we had a new design, looking at what happened when people came to the page and how they responded, and then making sure we were using approaches that actually got people to be more inclined to email their friends or, or to share on Facebook. Um, and we actually did a, a test, a comparative test, where we looked at how many people actually tell their friends when using the Share Progress page. Uh, as compared to how many people that are friends using what Credo had as their previous thank you share page, and found that uh, share products page actually gets about 50% more sharing by people. So that meant this means that we're getting a lot more people who are then uh, telling their friends and inviting them to also sign this petition. And then the last step is um, is actually um, trying to increase your click rate. So when people are sharing, when they're posting on Facebook, when they're sending an email to their friends, um, trying out different uh, language that they can use there. Um, so one of Share Progress uh, lets organizations actually um, try out at the same time different Facebook post language. So when someone clicks and posts their wall on Facebook, um, the headline that shows up there can be different. And we look at how, this, how people respond to different headlines and figure out which ones actually get more, people, uh, more people's friends to say, oh, this looks interesting. Let me click on it and come to the site. Um, and so what Credo found using that tool that we offer is that they tried out a couple of different Facebook titles um, that people could share with their friends. And that one of the titles actually um, did much, much better than, than the first title I started with. Um, in fact, if you look at how many people um, clicked on it, it was um, more than 63% more than that initial title it started with. So that meant they were getting a lot more people, a lot more of their supporters' friends coming and checking out their site than before. So 
what does this mean in total? So again, we can look at these optimizations and improvements on each step of the viral process uh, and then see what impact that has. So as I mentioned, overall, um, Credo had just over a quarter million people sign this petition. Um, and they ended up with uh, a little over 35,000 people who came in and signed because of, of this sharing of people recruiting their friends. Um, and that accounted for uh, just over 13% of the total, uh, total signatures on that petition. So 13.5% uh, so is what they ended up with here. Um, but what would have happened if they hadn't done that optimization? Um, I mentioned before how all those improvements can add up to a higher virality ratio. If we work backwards to see, okay, without those improvements, where would Credo have been? Instead of that virality ratio of one, or 0.135, we would have had a virality ratio of 0.056. So it would have been less than half as much. And that would have meant they would have gotten 22,000 less people signed the petition and 15,000 less new people um, recruited through that campaign. So being, uh, spending effort and time in order to, to have those, that, that uh, improved viral process made a big, big difference as far as um, how successful this campaign was for them. So um, as I saw early on, I, I know most of you are not at the level of credo with their millions of people on the email list. So I want to move to a campaign that uh, may be uh, more appropriate in size to, to what you're, you're looking at. Um, this one comes from the organization peers.org. Um, they're a nonprofit that just started this year. Um, they're working in the shareable economy space, so doing community building and organizing around uh, people who support this idea of um, reusing and sharing resources that we have. Um, some of the examples are things like Airbnb or Lyft car sharing um, or uh, Skillshare programs. Um, and so they ran, uh, it's also a petition um, that they're actually still running, but, um, uh, but they launched just a couple weeks ago, uh, which was uh, in Grand Rapids, Michigan, um, there was uh, legislation that was being considered that would ban Airbnb in that town. Um, and so there's a big community of people who use Airbnb um, either to, and sorry, for those who aren't familiar, Airbnb is a peer-to-peer um, uh, -peer, um, company that uh, pairs people up when they're looking for a place to stay. So instead of staying in a hotel, you can stay at, at someone else's um, apartment or house in the spare room they might have there. Um, and so they were running a campaign to help save it in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Um, and they were only targeting people who were actually living in Michigan. Um, so it was a pretty small group of people. And their, their goal for this campaign um, was initially to get 500 signatures, and later they increased it to 1,000 signatures. Um, and so if you look at what happened there, they received just under 1,100 signatures on that campaign. Um, only 584 of those signatures came from their, from their outreach round. They emailed uh, the people who they had on their email list uh, and posted on, on their Facebook account to try to get people to sign um, and got uh, just over 500 people. What happened then though is those people um, went out and recruited their friends and that brought in another almost 500 people um, to also sign a petition. Um, which increased the total number of signatures they had by 85%. So they went from just sort of 500 to, to more than 1,000 signatures that way. So the process they used was actually very, very similar to the one that Cree used for their campaign. Um, they put together an optimized petition page um, using some common best practices and actually doing some testing to figure out what made, uh, what made the page more, more effective and made more people more likely to, to want to add their names and sign a petition there. Um, they also used uh, our Share Progress pages in order to increase how many people were, were going on to tell their friends after they signed. Um, and then they also um, made a point of trying to use um, optimized share language. Um, so uh, make sure they're, they're sharing 
was using, um, using language that got people more interested in, in coming back and visiting their site. They didn't actually run any tests themselves, but they used some of the studies that we have done uh, to, um, to uh, include tricks, or not tricks, but include uh, approaches that, um, that generally make people more interested in, in responding. So one of them was when they gave people something to post on Facebook, they actually included the text signed the petition in the Facebook headline, which um, through a number of uh, through past analyses that um, uh, we've done with organizations uh, was found to actually increase the number of people who click on that and, and then sign petition by between 20 and 60 percent. Um, another one was when they had people send an email to their friends. They used a personal sub bank, uh, recommended a personal subject line in that email, something like "I just signed this, will you?" And uh, being more personal, also um, through past analyses, we found to um, get people to respond more than if you use something very generic like "Save Airbnb." Um, and so that that can make a big difference in, in how likely people are to to click back and, and check out your. Uh, your petition page and maybe at their name. So what happened overall? Um, again, they were peers made a point of trying to improve things at every all three steps of the viral process. Um, and what they ended up with was um, this virality ratio of 0.46, which was that 85% increase in action. Now if they hadn't done uh, all those, hadn't had all those increases, um, again, we can look at what might have happened otherwise. In that case, instead of a virality ratio of 0.46, it might have only been 0.166, which meant instead of getting 500 actions from social, they would have had only 116, um, so four, almost 400 less. And so instead of crossing that threshold of 1,000 in the tradition, they might have only had 700, um, which uh, if, if, if you're trying to convince someone of a power of a petition, crossing a, a big round number like that can make a big difference. Um, so those are that concludes uh, this part of the presentation. Um, so I'm happy to answer any questions you have at this point. Thank you so much for that, Jim. My mind is trying to go back to eighth grade and remember percentages and fractions and things right now. <laughs> so I would definitely need a calculator I think to figure some of the, the ratios out. But um, some great advice on how these campaigns can work. And you know, we have a whole bunch of questions, so I will go ahead and raise some of those up to you. Um, Christopher asked, most of my member base is pre-tech. How do you bridge the gap to that audience? So if you have people who are maybe not very familiar or very comfortable on computers, how do you help make it easy for them to get engaged in online campaigns? Sure. Any so, ideas? Uh, yeah, this, this actually uh, relates very closely to um, – I saw someone that, that posed a question about best practices as well. Generally, um, a lot of best practices are about making the whole process simpler. You want to make it very, very clear to people exactly what they need to do. So when you have, I'm actually going to, is it all right if I go back to a previous slide, Becky? Absolutely. Just go ahead and double click on it. Um, I'm going to hop back to this optimized decision page slide. Uh, actually, I'll go back to the part of this one. It's a little bit bigger. Um, making sure that um, you're keeping the, the web page very simple. You don't want there to be a lot of bells and whistles or things that might distract people. Um, and confuse them as to, as to what they should be doing there. You want to have a very clear, it's called the ask on the page, very clear directions as to what they're doing there, um, and then a very clear way for them to do that. So here you see we have the petition title that describes exactly what the goal is here, so it's Airbnb and Grand Rapids, and then an image, and then right there, tell the Grand Rapids City Council the light of vote and protect home sharing in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Clear fields for their first name, their last name, an email address, and a zip code. So not too many things for them to fill in. Uh, just four options here, and then a, a big button to say add my name. So just keeping it simple um, can make a big, big difference as far as how many people will engage there. 
And similarly, on our share page, um, we try to make our, a lot of our testing has been to try to make it very clear what needs to happen there. Um, not tons of things going on here. There's an arrow pointing you where you need to be looking on the page, and then a big button for you if you want to send an email to your friends, and a big button if you want to be um, posting on Facebook. So again, making sure that it's simple and clear. Great. And I noticed on the um, the actual optimized petition page that there's not much text. Like you have a little bit of text down in the lower left, but the main bolded action is one bolded sentence and one not bolded sentence that's telling people really clearly what you want them to do. So that's for somebody who likes to write and talk a lot, that's really helpful to see just how little text is needed to get the message across. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We had um, somebody asking, you know, uh, these are a couple of best practices I think that you're highlighting here, and you mentioned a couple of other best practices. Are there any other best practices that you'd want to share that may be mentioned in the two articles that we'll link people to after? Um, mm -hmm. But any other ones that you'd want to highlight for the group? So I would say um, on, on your action page, whether that's a petition page or an email sign up or, or a donation page, um, making things clearly visible when someone first visits that page. Uh, a lot of times I see organizations that have a lot of either a lot of a big menu or a lot of text up top, and you actually have to scroll down to find where you're supposed to, um, to put in any information and actually um, submit, uh, submit something on, on the side, making sure that it's clearly visible from the start is another one that will help a lot. Um, and yeah, those are, are really the main ones. Um, it's, uh, as far as the web pages go, um, for, uh, for what's being shared, what you're using for your Facebook uh, or email sharing text, um, let me go back to this, that's back to the slide. Um, also, generally being, being clear um, is very helpful there. Um, we, there's the two that I mentioned here um, using actually the phrase sign the petition uh, on Facebook if you're running a petition um, or being personal in your emails. Um, we've definitely seen consistently seem to get more people to respond. Um, there aren't any others, um, any other standouts that we've found recently beyond those two. Um, but, uh, but as I said, clarity is generally helpful. Now would that also work for something like we have um, Regina asking about best practices for educational institutions like how to get more donations or recruit students. Would that sort of action phrase work for donate today or, <laughs> or different terms? Or is it really very specific to petitions that people are signing that you found real success rates? Uh, we, we know we're quite certain that it's that it is true petition. Uh, it's hard to say at this point uh, how well it would translate into other things. Um, I think there's certainly a good possibility. Um, generally, what we like to do is is for any anything like that, we, we do like to actually test it uh, and and to try out uh, try out different language and, and see what happens, which is. Again, part of part of what share progress is designed to do is that when you're asking people to share, instead of having to just choose one option, it gives you the ability to try out a couple of different options um, and then see what happens. Which is uh, that, that's what I was describing earlier with the Credo experiment. This was just on a single on that one campaign. They actually tried out four different possibilities um, for a Facebook post to see see what was actually done. Great. So just even through your regular email blast, just testing those titles or on Facebook, testing the titles that you're putting out there and seeing what they get. Um, and somebody asked, uh, Lisa asked, can these, can these results be computed for Facebook? Like is there Facebook analytics that you can look at that would show you the success of the different titles? How do you get that information out of Facebook? That's what uh, Share Progress tracks. We actually um, log all that information and, and tell you that. Okay, so if somebody doesn't have Share Progress, um, are they able to do that through anything natively in Facebook or through maybe another third-party tool? 
Uh, unfortunately not. There's, there isn't any other uh, social media language testing uh, systems out there, at least that I'm aware of at this point. Um, there, there, there may be others in the future, but, but right now I'm okay. in part of the initial progress is the only one. You guys are the innovators in that space. That's great. Um, you know, Christopher asked a good question. You know, for folks who might just have an email list and they're sending it out through their personal email or Outlook, um, how do you get petitions signed and shared with those elected bodies? You know, like how do you get those emails to Congress? And I think that speaks to, again, tools that are made to do that. And I can give some examples of those kind of tools that are out there um, from very low cost to really, really expensive. Um, just naming like Nation Builder or Salsa, um, Convio, those are a few company names that provide services for email blasts um, that can target elected officials. I'm sure, Jim, that you can name many, many others. So if you'd like to name any others that they might want to look into, that um, you're welcome to do that. Yeah, one, uh, an, another one that comes to mind is Blue State Digital is another one that does that. And then there's actually a, one that's very new. It's only a few months old, but it's actually free. Um, it's called Action Network. Um, uh, they, they offer a lot of those same tools. So, so I would in, encourage or, uh, groups to check that out. Um, the other thing I would say is that um, if, if for whatever reason you can't sign up for one of those platforms, at least in the short term, um, you, can, you can do that manually. You can create a Google survey form that um, asks people to add their name, and then you can actually print out and hand deliver the signatures to whoever your target is there. Um, but there are, uh, Becky is exactly right, there are a lot of um, good tools out there now to help with that as well. Great. And we'll try and include some of the links to a few of those. It won't be any comprehensive list because we, I think between the two of us, probably couldn't cover all of them even if we wanted to. Um, but we'll, we'll send out a list of a few of those in the follow-up email for people who don't have a tool to reach out to Congress members and would like to. Um, so Lisa asks a good question, and there are a couple of people actually asked a question related, sort of similar. Is there a good way to ride the coattails of a different viral campaign? So her example is that they have an optical illusion senior dance in Michigan. How do they ride the coattails of the German optical illusion dance success? So this is referring to a, a different viral video that was very popular. And I know a lot of people have been um, piggybacking on BatKid. If you haven't heard about BatKid in San Francisco, um, that was a big viral social media campaign that um, you know, helped a little boy become Batman for the day. And um, people are creating all kinds of other bat cats and bat <laughs> you know, to ride on that sort of theme and the enthusiasm around it. So is there a way to piggyback well? Uh, I wouldn't say there's any definitive recipe for it. Um, I think certainly campaigns that are more topical generally do better. Um, so if you can find something that's, that's in the public consciousness, uh, and then I mean, the trick is to actually make something that is, is in itself compelling but that has that theme, then that can certainly be effective. Um, but what I've seen is that when, when groups try to just just try to piggyback on a theme without any real substance to their own campaign, I generally haven't seen that go too well. There needs to be something solid um, in, in whatever you're doing as well. Great. Great. So Cynthia asked, there are a couple of questions actually asked about testing. And so Cynthia's question is specifically, do you take a chance on burning people out when using them to test? And um, another related question was, you know, do you ask people, a group of people every time to test out the, the different titles or different statements that you're making? And I think a little explanation of A-B testing might be helpful because you're not over, you know, testing people repeatedly with the same message. You're testing parts of your, of your outreach with many of them. So yeah. Can you explain that a little bit more clearly for people? So the idea behind A-B testing is you're, you're not splitting out a, a separate focus group that you, you are asking. You're, you're not asking people what they would like best. You're actually um, taking the people that you are contacting, generally through an email send, um, 
and you are taking at random some of those people and sending some of them your first idea and some of them your second idea, and you're looking at how they respond. Um, and so there, the, the people in those groups aren't, be given, aren't being given both options and have to choose. They're just being given one of those options. But by looking at how people respond in those different groups, you're able to see if one of those options actually is a lot more compelling than the other. Um, so on, on this slide here, what you're seeing um, is, well, maybe this is probably more detailed than I'm going to right now. Um, but uh, what, what you're doing is, so everyone is only getting this one, uh, one possible ability for, say, the, the share post. And then you're, just, uh, you're, you're using their response in each one to decide what you give to everyone else. Um, the system that we use in Share Progress is actually we do it dynamically so that as soon as we discover that something is completely better than others, automatically people, everyone starts getting that. Um, so what that means is that there's actually very little risk to testing because if, if you happen to choose one option that's particularly worse than others, almost immediately people will stop getting it. Um, and if you choose something that to be much better than others, almost immediately everyone will start getting that. Um, so there's, there's, there's not much chance of burning a lot of people that way. Great. That's a helpful explanation. Um, so we have, uh, let's see, Katie is asking, you know, our organization is very small and lean. We don't have much of a communications or marketing budget at all. Is there any advice on how to stretch our budget or find free tools to make easy and effective online campaigns? I know we mentioned a couple of specifically political advocacy tools that can help you reach Congress members, but do you have any other recommendations of really free or inexpensive tools for online campaigns? Yeah, again, I would check out Action Network since that is free. Um, if you're looking for something to manage more of a say donor outreach network, um, Salesforce does offer uh, free service for, for organizations, for, for nonprofits with fewer than 10 users. Um, there's a lot of nice, uh, there's some good Google products out there that are free. Um, Google surveys you can, you can set up for free. Um, for social media management, Hootsuite is, is one I, I'm a fan of for, for managing that. Um, so I, I, I don't have a comprehensive list off the top of my head, but, but those are some to, to take a look at. Great. Um, we also have a question from Chris asking, do you test using Facebook and then do an email campaign? Or is there a specific order that you need to do the testing in? Or are you testing for both and doing them concurrently? Is it, you know, what's the process like for that? So there's not, we don't do a separate phase for testing. It's, it's all together. Um, and that's uh, the, the first other thing about, about the way we do A-B testing is that um, it's really invisible that you launch a campaign, you send your email list and say, hey, please, please sign a petition or, or please uh, make a donation here. And then as they do that, as they start to share with their friends, uh, the system will automatically be, be giving them different versions and looking at, at what happens and uh, adjusting on its own without you having to worry about doing any sort of splitting or segmenting. Cool. So Rhoda asks, um, how long does it take to get your campaign started? So from beginning to end, or is there a different time frame for every campaign? So you mentioned the Grand Rapids um, Airbnb campaign and that it started a couple of weeks ago, and then you had results for today but said it was continuing. Do you have a set time frame for how long they typically last? So generally when, when, when you do sign up for one of these different um, digital management systems that, that we were talking about like Nation Builder or, or Salsa or Convideo or Action Network, um, you, there's some initial setup required where you have to kind of design your pages in there and, and get things set up. Once you've gotten over that hump of, of having that ready, to actually start a new campaign can be very fast. Um, you need to figure out what sort of language you want to use around it, but then the technical setup can happen over the course of just a few hours. Um, so you can, you can move very quickly in response to the things that are happening in the world. 
Um, and then uh, a lot more and more systems are providing actually real-time data on what happens. So uh, share progress among them. So you can actually, as soon as you send out an email or as soon as you post to Facebook and start getting people to respond, you can see what's, what's happening there with it. Great. And then is there an end time usually to a campaign? Like you start a petition or you start a drive for you know, signatures for something um, or sign-ons, and do you usually have an end date in mind when you start it up? It's really going to depend on the campaign. Sometimes you're working up against the real-world deadline. Maybe there's a vote in Congress or in some municipal council, um, or maybe a company is going to be making a decision about something, or maybe you're at your end of the month fundraising deadline. And so in those cases, there's a, there's a hard deadline built into it. Um, otherwise, it may be something where, where there isn't. It, it could, can in theory, continue for a very long time. Um, often you don't want to be pushing things potentially over the course of weeks or months unless there's clear progress. So you may artificially say, we have a goal of getting this done by this week. Um, but it, it will vary a lot uh, depending on the situation. So even if you have sort of an ongoing advocacy campaign or ongoing education campaign um, that you know, is part of your mission for, to, to work on for years and years, you still want to try and find you know, smaller chunks of time to work on a specific piece or highlight a specific piece in campaign so that people don't just ignore it as sort of the normal noise. Well, thank you so much, Jim, for all of your great expertise. I'm sorry we didn't get to everybody's questions, but we did get most of them answered today. I'd like to just share a few resources that you know, we mentioned earlier on Jim's slide, some of the best practices. We'll share those links, and we'll see if there are any others that we can come up with in the follow-up email that you'll get after this webinar wraps up later today. We'll also make sure to include some of those tools that we talked about that can be used for um, political and advocacy campaigns, as well as some of just the, the tools that are available out there for online campaigns of any stripe. Thank you so much for joining us today, Jim. We really appreciate it. And thank you, Ali, on the back end for helping manage all of the questions that came in. I'd also like to just take a moment to thank our, our webinar sponsor, ReadyTalk, for providing this webinar platform so that we can present these webinars to you on a regular basis. Our next webinar is next Tuesday, November 26th, and it's a site tour of TechSoup. So if you are not familiar with our organization and would like to learn more about the donation programs, we'll be sure to include a link to that webinar in the follow-up as well so you can join us for a quick tour of our site. Thank you all so much, and be sure to take the post-event survey that pops up when you close your screen so we can continue to improve our webinar program. Thank you all, and have a terrific day.